So I don't care what anybody says, I am smart. All right, so my name is Derek Babb from Operational Streamlining, and today we're gonna to talk about maximum customization. And we have 45 minutes, so we'll see what we can get in here. My slide, um, my presentation I gave on uh, Wednesday morning was 225 slides long. So we try to try to condense that down for you guys this morning. All right, just to get started, what I want to cover first is that I look at maximum approach with three complementary objectives. The first one is to simplify. Maximo, in my mind, is just paperwork. You've got users, guys out in the field, they're trying to wrench just 105 degree types of seats. The last thing they want to do is deal with the computer system. If I were a mechanic and Maximo told me that I can't close a work order, I would say, why don't you come out here and try to do my job for a while? Tell me you can't close a work order. You don't know anything about work. So the data needs to be there, needs to be complete, needs to be organized. You need to try to eliminate wherever you can out of Maximo. The things you can eliminate, try to automate, and then whatever's left, simplify. And what I wanted to give an example of this, I think it's a very powerful idea. So that's your out-of-the-box work order tracking screen. With my current customer, that's what we've gotten down to. And it might look, it is simple, it's simple, but it's not simplistic. We have a lot of really complicated business processes running behind this all put the workflow. We have workers take different paths based upon if they're preventative maintenance, if they're corrective maintenance, if they're emissions after testing, if it's an environmental PM, all that builds the workflow, as well as a subflow for supervisors to either approve or rework work orders. And what we did is we took all of that and we put it high behind one button that we put on the toolbar. We changed the workflow to route, you know, the typical route workflow button, turn into a bullseye. And we tell trained people, if you don't know what to do on a work order, just click the bullseye. And at any point in time on that work order, they click the bullseye and it will give them the options of what they can do. You can review it, you can accept it, assign someone else. If you're a supervisor, you can review it, accept it, send it back to someone for rework. So, simple, but not simplistic. Now, once you got that down, take what you have, strengthen it. Just like life. You gotta get rid of people in your life, you're dragging you down, things are dragging you down. You gotta gather up the friends and the people who bring you up, build you up, and you gotta cultivate them. Same concept applies to Maximo. You gotta get rid of the things that waste time, that just are a distraction to people, and then focus on strengthening things that you do that are working for you. One way to do that is to have integrated training. This is an idea that came from Tiffany Briegenbach at Nice Source. And her idea was to put guides onto the screen, right there for people to click on. And so our mechanics, they can click on any of these links that you see right here, and they can put up a PDF file on the right hand side of the screen that shows how to walk through the process, and that's more on the left, and just step by step, go through the process and get order done. Easy. High value customization, performance reliability, and clustering. How many of you guys are actually using a cluster in Maximo instance? Outstanding. You can actually take it, break it apart into different parts. You have one cluster that's running the UI, one that's running the MIT, one that's running the Chrome task. I saw an incredible speed up with just user interface and doing that. And I was afraid, if you put them onto an ESXi platform, I was afraid it was going to be slow. Because if I had it running on bare metal, turns out it's actually faster. So I find the whole clustering approach to be outstanding. One of the benefits of using half a here, so it's another good topic, good good uh, good thing to do with your maximum implementation. Now, as far as customizations go, I did want to give some examples. So these are some things that I've worked on in the past. We, um, you guys, you have uh, one of the customers has a fleet of about two hundred compression units, two thousand assets, about thousand compression units, and they need to be able to run their preventative maintenance program. But most of these machines do not have a physical run hours meter. And the ones that do have a physical run hours meter, the PLC, if there's a power outage, if there's a set, it's not the most accurate data. So we need a clever way to be able to know how long these machines have run without actually having a physical run hours meter. And the solution was to be able to take the downtime, to be able to take the asset status changes, and from those, compute how much a machine ran in a given day. So this is an example that I don't know how you would do this other than to, to do maximum customization. We should have service, we should have listeners that listen for the downtime changes, for asset status changes. And then we used a parallelization. 
We're not gonna have time to cover this morning, but that's a technique of taking a very large amount of work and breaking it apart across multiple threads. We use that with the UI process for updating these, the, the, the runtime, or if you update the downtime, or update the asset size change, a parallel process kicks off. It goes and looks at all the downtime records that are impacted, all, all the uh, all the run out of time records are impacted, and compute changes in real time. It works outstandingly. But it solves a very big, very difficult problem, and you can run a preventive maintenance off of that. Another example, and I won't, we have a tiered preventive maintenance program, use a special algorithm for generating a workload, don't worry too much about that. But what I thought was really nifty is that we built a customization that for, this customer has a lot of job plans, and those job plans have a lot of meters. If you're not aware, you have to have a conditional monitoring point set up, point set up in order to get the meter readings off of the work order onto the asset history. Now, we built a customization that whenever a work order was assigned to, or whenever a job that was being assigned to a work order, it first made sure that those conditional monitoring points existed for that asset job plan pair, that, for, that, for that job plan being used for every asset meter pair that was going to be used that made sure those conditional monitoring points existed. And if it didn't, if they didn't, it created them and used some default values that we had to set the, the upper and lower bounds on the conditional monitoring points. That customization alone manages 108,000 conditional monitoring points in this customer. That one you can actually do with automation scripts. So part of the seminar is gonna be trying to draw that line of what you can do and what you can't do with customization or without customization. All right, so two more. Previous customer, we built one customization that took care of 7,000 to compare, took care of automatically closing 7,000 purchase orders per year. Ends up saving one FTE and ends up reducing the amount of capital that's tied up, that has to sit out there because the purchase orders are open, by $600,000. Which is today, you know, back then wasn't that big of a deal, but now when every penny counts, it's an important thing. And then another example is we had another, we had another customization that when invoices were coming across the MIT from a third party vendor, we were able to build up a rules-based engine that could look at those invoices, see where they're coming from, what the amounts were, and could potentially approve them based upon the set criteria. And that that particular enhancement handles about thirty-seven thousand invoices per year. Thirty-seven thousand invoices per year. That's another whole entity that's saved. All right. So simplify, strengthen, optimize. So I don't have a whole lot that we're going to. We're going to talk about this whole lot. It's, it's, Big thing in itself. The main thing that I wanted to bring out, and I think everybody in this room knows this, is that if you don't have the data in Maximo, you're not going to be able to use any of the analytic tools. So the, the challenge is to make sure you have a system that people are using. You know, the mechanics, they're perfectly fine with using Big Chief, right? So you got to have a system that they want to use, that is beneficial to them, and you have the right customizations, configurations, whatever in there to make sure you're getting the right data work for that you need. All right, so I've been programming for Maximo for several years now, and I started off with Maximo 6. My first, my, my boss asked me at IBM, you know, we need someone who can take over Maximo. They couldn't find anyone qualified. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So Jim asked me, hey, Derek, do you mind when I do this stuff? I said, no problem. Now, what do they say in the army? You guys know this? Never volunteer. So I stuck with it. Um, my experience when I started Program Maximo, Maximo 6, we weren't a whole lot of resources, really nothing online. We have, today we have some blogs and, and people are putting in more information up here, but there really wasn't anything. It was a one site buried in W3 at IBM where someone had put some information out for the other consultants, and that was it. I called IBM support and said, hey, you know, I'm taking over this project. I really don't know how this stuff works. Can you help me out? Not our bag, not what we do. And they said, well, how can I get some help? They said, we gotta call the guy at GPS who does this. So I called the guy. And the guy says, you know, well, I sure have to sit down with you to put you with some people for an hour, an hour or two. But after that, we charge $300 plus an hour. And my customer at the time was putting a vent blender rate of $40 an hour. So there was not a snowball chance on the Plutonian shore that that man or anyone in this group was gonna be able to help us. So there I was, stuck with it. And I, I, I wanted to do it. I had to learn Maximo the hard way. 
So that was my experience, and my job was to handle all of the customizations that had been done by a third party and figure those out. And it was wrong. And, but that's what I did, and that's what I'm really good at doing. And the challenge that I have now with customers is that I don't think that they should be doing it. I don't think they should be doing the customization if you can avoid it. And so what I am trying to do is build up a way of communicating what the options are and helping people who are decision makers and developers, managers, developers, everybody, understand where they can use a less difficult approach and where they do need to use customization. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish. And the first step that I came up with in trying to communicate this is the configuration customization spectrum. And so you want to start on the left hand side of this and not, you want to stay on the left and uh, not to, um, to repeat Russell's statement that he made yesterday about not trying to make a political statement. There's not, there's none there. So you guys want me to get the joke, stay on the left? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of dumb. All right. So stay on the left. And then these are all generalizations that are covered on the spectrum. Specializations, things like PMs, those are configurable, very useful, but they're specialized, they're used for a certain thing. These are all general concepts that can be used to get any kind of working maximum done. So the first stop is gonna be your organizational settings. Let me get my watch out, make sure I'm doing it. All right, your first stop is gonna be organizational settings. Now, if you haven't taken the time to sit down this is the meta, this is just demo data. If you haven't taken the time to sit down and go through the different options, do so. It gives you a lot of insight about what you can figure maximum. And you might have some ideas saying, you know, we're having a problem with this particular process. If I make this one little tweak inside of maximum, it might solve the problem. Also, if you're a developer and you're trying to figure out why maximum is having this crazy behavior and you can't get it to work the way you want to, this should be one of your places to look. I have found a solution here more at least half a dozen times. All right, next one. Domains. When I make an any kind of a complicated Excel spreadsheet, I have a sheet for domains. They're that useful. In Maximum, you have these different types, synonym, alphanumeric, some of the numeric ones, table crossover. The ones I wanted to touch on briefly this morning, synonym domains. This is the one that if you're new to Maximo, can be very confusing. When the programmers are actually going through and building Maximo, and they're doing stuff with statuses, they have to have a defined set of values to work off of. So how is it that you can create your own statuses that work with the code with the code? And the way that's accomplished is using a cinema domain. So you have all these built-in values where it says internal, internal values, things like decommission, not ready, operating. That's what Maximum was actually programmed to work off of. But you can go in and you can say, you know, I need to have a status that says waiting on permit. Well, that's pretty similar to not ready. And you can create that synonym for the not ready status. That's how it's done. That's how it works. And that didn't, I, that didn't click for me at the very beginning. Another one that I, that was also just kind of baffling because I never sat down and looked at it. I just listened, I just didn't look at it. It's a crossover thing. I had two guys come up to me yesterday and they were asking me about how to do something. Um, and it, what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to pull values off of the master PM and put it onto the PM when it was generated. And it didn't want to customize the PM process, which they shouldn't, if they can avoid it. The way to accomplish that is use a crossover domain. You create, go into Maximo, create your fields on the PM record, and then create your crossover domains to pull the, the values that you want off the master PM on the PM. Done. All right, data configuration, database configuration. I almost didn't put this on, I didn't put this on here at the beginning when I created this. This is something that I use so often, you just don't even think about it. But database configures where you can go in, you can set up your records, set up new objects, change objects, set up your, your attributes, indices. One of the things that programmers will often neglect is you create indices for your projects. They get the coding right, they test it out, everything's working great, they put it into production, it works, and all of a sudden they start to realize it's really slow. I put the indices in. So don't forget the indices. Also, if you go into database configuration, you're going to find the relationships you can find for objects. They're all out of the box. Now, what's great about these is that they save you time. So if you end up doing any type of programming with Maximo, either your automation script, your TRM, your job customization, you can leverage these relationships. The normal process you're going to go through is I'm going to open up an object, I'm going to 
pull out the remedial records, you know, do some things, play safe, that's it. You can use your relationship to pull those remedial records. Very powerful. So, it's to look at them. All right, roles. Roles are one of the three pillars of workflow. So roles that you primarily will use before is to define a person or to find a person group. There's some other options as well. Whenever you're using roles, best practice is going to be to use a person group. You never want to tie things to one individual person. You would rather it's much better to decouple. That's a very common practice we use in computer science. Decouple. So you can use person group to decouple uh, the, the, the roles from that and actual user. So that's a good practice, best practice. Uh, yeah. Now, communication templates. They're just email, right? There's nothing super special about these. Uh, they're just let you go in, put your messages, and say who it's going to go to. But it's another configurable, generic tool that you can use. Actions. The second of the three pillars of workflow. Actions are extremely versatile concepts in that respect. And you can go in, you have these options where you can create an application, you can set an action to do something that's already defined in an application. There's some built-in uh, kind of uh, shortcut, like for change status, set the value. You can create groups of actions, and then you can also do your custom class. And you can also execute external applications which I've never done before, never had to. But the, the key thing here is application actions, change status, and your custom class, and set value too. For the application actions, if, you, if you've never done it before, to see what they are, go into Application Designer, pull up an application like Bootrack, and look at the Add, Modify, Signature options from Select Action. And what that will tell you is what all the different actions are that are defined for that application. You can take any of those and put them into your action, and then use that action in workflow for escalations. Very powerful. Escalations. So as a programmer, I've had the habit that whenever I have to do any kind of a time-based process, I will implement a current task. I will pull the data from Maximo, I will do the work on the objects, and then to justify all of that, I'll create a fancy report and set it up. But I have to tell you, batch processing, so 1970s, learn to use escalations. You can use the escalation Combine with an action. You get a lot done without having to customize anything. And if you do need to write some customization, write your custom action class, put it into an action, and use an escalation. Very powerful. Expressions. Expressions for SQL. Also, in most places in the Maximo where you can put SQL, you can also put a condition custom class. Condition, our expressions are the third pillar of workflow. So with uh, roles, Actions and condition, expressions, conditions, you can build up a very complex, sophisticated workflow. Here's an example. This is this is one, guys. I tried to I tried to make these easier to see. I, I you can use Photoshop and crank up the the levels on this to make it, it looks a little bit better on here, but still hard to see. This is just asset meter, and it's, it's checking to see if the asset has a meter. And then also you have this very safe way of additional expression builder that you can use in Maximo. All right, workflow. I'm a big fan of workflow. I think it's, I think it's a great tool. Once you get over some of the difficulties with it, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, you can basically define for an object and set to auto initiate when someone saves. You can, it can handle, it basically handles assignments. You have um, decision nodes where it basically are previous statements, like in your programming, you can replicate that behavior. And you can define uh, you know, manual, manual interaction, manual input from the customer, and also wait on events. I had one customer where they would create a purchase request that would then create an RFQ, and then that RFQ would be sent out across the interface, and the workflow would wait until they received a bit of response back, and would fire the workflow back out there. So very, very, very clever. This is one from the demo data, you guys really can't see it, but I do want to point out that, see this right here? That's your, that's your if else statement that you can replicate in the workflow using decision notes. I did that once on a, pro on a project and I thought it was so clever, and then I stopped this and I thought, well, I'm gonna smart people too, all right. 
All right, so signature options. We have one customer that they have, we're pulling another part of, like someone in a separate Maximo instance into our Maximo instance. We want to make sure that they can see the same, or their same screen. So what we're doing is we're using signature options to show one Maximo or one more quarter tracking screen, and then they'll show another one for the other customer, all based upon just what security you're doing. So you can do this, you do this customization you can do this configuration, you can basically change what the screen looks like dramatically without having to do any customization. Application designer, if you guys, pretty straightforward. Just where you can go in and just construct your, app, construct your, construct your applications. Nothing super special about that. There's your widgets that you have, and there's your text box properties. Also, if you're, if you're ever wondering where the dialogue were, you're fine. All right, Nick, now we're starting to get into the material that we're going to talk about this morning. So, one strategy I recommend for example, customers, if any of that under customization does not work, or configuration does not work, is to consider building the customization that you have to do outside of Maximo. Okay? You can use the MIF, you can use a soap, set of SOAP service, REST service, and you can communicate to Maximo through that, you can do queue, message queues if you're so applied, or you can see all of that, you can use transaction tables, you can the database, you can get in, get it out, done. One customer spent four years building customizations for procurement, all a lot of you know, really neat ideas. They're actually going to a different platform now. They got bought, going to a different platform. All of those, all of those customizations are potentially going to be lost. If they haven't been implemented outside of Maximo or based upon a generic workflow, a generic asset, a generic purchase order, it's a very good likelihood that they can still utilize these customizations. So it's a very, when you're looking at customizing and building custom processes, start off by looking at doing it outside of Maximo. It's also a lot easier to hire a .NET programmer than it is to hire a Maximo developer. So for cost of implementation, cost of maintenance, you might be Also, it will not impact your upgrade at point because you have no customizations inside of Maximo. All right, automation scripts. So the truth is, one of the reasons why I'm doing all this is that it's forcing me to learn automation scripts and also go back and practice more in Tierra. I do customization, and I think that the approach, best approach is that if you already have a customer that's doing a lot of customization, stick with that. Fair enough to have two different things going on at the same time. But because of that, I've never taken the time to sit down and try to do a serious project custom using automation scripts. So we're only going to cover a very small amount of material this morning, but I'm actually building out a huge seminar around doing online for people. And in each, and what I'm doing is I'm covering each type of the customization points that you can do a maximum. And I provide a trivial example that goes through just setting up a shell for that particular type of customization, but it's valuable because it shows you how to do that, what the configuration steps are. And then for each type of customization point, we're going to do a non-trivial example where we give like a real-world use cases, develop real-world requirements and then implement that in Maximo to show you how it's done. In addition to that, I'm also going to provide implementations in automation scripts and implementations in CRM Force Manager. So that if you're a manager or you're a developer and you have your task with a decision of trying to decide how do we custom, are we going to customize Maximo or not, I'm going to put this material out here so that you can read through it, you can work through the examples, and you can see how difficult each one of these top, each one of the methodologies is and you can make a decision for yourself what works for best. But automation scripts, available since the Master 7.5, sanctioned by IBM. You can write them in both Jython, Python, and you can also do them in JavaScript. And then know that's a risk learning. They work with objects, attributes, services. You can also define conditions, and uh, they work with integration. So actions and conditions mean you can use them with workflow and solutions. So now we get to the supported threshold. If you stay on the left hand side of the threshold and you have a problem with Maximo, I didn't help you. But once you pass beyond the threshold, what they will tell you, they'll still help you. But what they're going to say is that we need you to be able to replicate the problem in an uncustomized version of Maximo. 
Now, that's like saying, let's say you have a car that you love, you love this car, you put a bunch of rims on it, you got a stereo, it's four wheel drive, great, everything works on it, you just love this car, and you have 250,000 miles on it, and you take it to the dealership, it starts making this noise. And you know, you're a good mechanic, but you can't quite figure it out, or you don't have the time. So he brings to the dealership and he asked her, what's going on, what's going on with this? He says, sure, we can help you. But we need you to replicate that noise if your car has 250,000 miles on it, that's been you know, souped up with a special radio and nice seats and, and nice rims. We should make the same sound on this brand new off the lot car. That's crazy, right? So part of what I want to be able to hit on this morning is the fast track protocol. It's how to work with IBM in the event that you have customized max engines, you kind of come up with a process to mitigate the pushback you get from those guys. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that, but let's go ahead and get on to some of those topics first. So CSS, you can actually customize CSS the same as you can go for like add icons. You can add it to the skin that you're using, and then, but don't, don't bother. You can go through, there's a time link right there, that'll pull up a document of the existing CSS options that are maximum. Use those, they, 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 they're, they're adequate for most everything that we do. All right, TRM. I did some TRM web back a couple years ago. Venerator product, been around for a long time, been back since Maximo 6. Let you do pretty much everything that is covered in the seminar, except for maybe building custom dial, like custom maps, custom dialogue. I don't think you can do that very well, I don't think you can do that. Um, but can do pretty much everything else. Still though, it passes the support threshold. So if you call IBM and you have TRM installed and you're having a problem, IBM's gonna say, you need to reduce that on customized version of Maximo. But TRM supports their product, so you can work with that. So it's a bit of a compromise between not being having, having any kind of customization or, or excuse me, on basic scripts, and then going full on Java customization. So can you guys guess what we're gonna talk about next? Java customization. Same technology used to build Maximo. You can augment existing behavior or implement new behavior in Maximo. 10 examples for you guys of what can be what can happen. First one is gonna be Maximum business objects. This is where you can house all of your complex business logic. You can use it to create new objects. You can also add new objects to augment existing apps. Like if you have a work order, you want to have some new table that's connected to it, you can do it that way. Um, or you can create, or just create full on new apps yourself and then build applications, create new objects that you can then build new applications on top of. Field value adapters used to implement complex validation for a single point. Instead of putting all of your logic into Mavo, it's break it apart and put it into field value adapters. And then you can reuse the same code for that particular type of field in multiple places. Very powerful. Uh, you can also use the field value adapter to dynamically augment your app behavior. So if you go in and you say, hey, I have this type of work order, well, then you know you can go in and you can set this field, this field, and this other field to require. So very powerful. Contacts. Up and up here, create batch, create parallelized batch processes and interact with external systems. That's what I think cron test should be used for. You have some big process that's got to run on time base, it's got to pull data from some place, and it has to crunch numbers. I've taken processes that run 48 hours and knock them down to eight using the concept of parallelization, which is just using multiple threads to process the data. So you can do that with cron test. Great. Services. Services are used as primarily stuff do two things. Instead of custom listeners, where you're listening to the maximum event system and maintaining actions based upon what you see. And then just to centralize your functionality. If you have some common things that you do across multiple Mavos, you would centralize the functionality inside of a service. Also, if you have a service, you can call methods from RMI. So if you want to build some process that you you call across from a like discrete fashion, you put instead of going um, doing a lot of processing Maximo, the, the base maximum functionality on a lot of network traffic, you can build your logic into a service and just interact with that service. It's never thought inside Maximo. It's pretty useful. And then integration user exits, you can, it's like gatekeeper for all the inbound and outbound messages coming from Maximo. Actions, conditions, and roles. So these are the three pillars of workflow. So custom behavior can be leveraged within workflow and with escalations to extremely versatile actions. Uh, conditions, complex logic, not replicable, not replicable in SQL, potential integration with external systems. 
So let's say that you have a workflow that has the necessity of at one particular point, at our particular point, reaching out to an external system and saying, hey, this is what I have, what do I do? Do I go left or do I go right? That's what you can use a custom condition in to, to accomplish. Roles, again, just precise selection of persons and person groups. One of the patterns that I often see or often do is that I will create a set of person groups for each location or each asset. And then, based upon the type of information, like the type of work order, I'll use a custom role to go and select the right person group to assign the work order and workflow. UI means they augment the behavior of existing apps. Of course, you can use them to create your own apps. This is one of the areas where the other solutions will not, are, not, are not suited, so you'll need to do customization. And then our, our my base tools. I had a customer that, I had a customer that was behind. Um, not having the best implementation. And what I did is I we sat down and talked about all the things that were wrong, things that need to be cleaned up. And you're, you should not be going through the back end and changing Maximo through the database. That's a huge no-no, very easy to break things. The middle ground is to implement an RMI-based tool that goes in through the business layer, the business object layer, and makes the changes that you want to accomplish. So you can use an RMI-based tool to clean up your Maximo, do any kind of algorithmic changes that you need to do, that you need to do. And I, I have just a whole list of different fixes that we had to do that are implemented in RMI. It's just a very powerful mechanism. But when, it's hard to get set up, like it's, it's a bit tricky, but once you get it set up and working, um, it's, just, it's a great, great technology, great tool to have in your toolkit. JavaScript pages, these are, you can build, you can build full on applications in Maximo. The work center is releasing with 7.605, you just have to do it this way. And then finally, the patching. So back in the old days of Maximo 6, back in the old days of Maximo 6, uh, back when we had the rewrite of C++ and Java, you often had to take matters into your own hands when you had a problem. There were many of them. Now, it's, just, it's very easy to decompile Maximo to make changes, recompile it, and redeploy. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So don't do it. If you do end up patching, what you're going to find, and this is what I went through with a customer that had a seriously patched Maximo, every time you do an update, you have to look at the old class, the new class that's being updated, that the new class IBM is giving you. And then you have to you have to decompile it, so you're going to break your support agreement with IBM by doing that. You have to look at what's changed between the two releases, then look and see what they fixed, and figure out, do I need to bring this over? Do I need to keep this? Do I need to get rid of it? It's a very time-consuming process. And then once you get it done, there's really not an adequate way to test all of Maximo, obviously. So you just hope that you haven't broken anything. So it's just, it's, if Maximo's broken, let IBM fix it. If you have a customized environment, follow the fast-track protocol that runs the other. And it's time-sensitive, that's what it came off. If you do not patch Maximo, if you do, you will break your support agreement. You may have a five years left in your support agreement. You're paying two hundred thousand dollars a year. If IBM finds out that you've had deep help and patch Maximo, they will they will forfeit your support, and you will still have to pay your contract for the next five years. It'll be out eight hundred thousand dollars. So just don't do it. Even game up. <laughs> Thou shalt not patch. <laughs> All right. This is the core of what I'm trying to communicate. We don't have time to go over this very much. Um, the main idea, though, is that you want to be, you want to do test-driven development. So you want to build tests for the customizations you're doing and build up your test suites so that you can do automated regression testing. You want to construct your extensions XML. I have a toolkit that I'm going to publish online where I've constructed a tool that will scan Maximo, scan your source code, and build this thing for you because it can be extremely tedious. Most people don't do this. But what happens is that when you update Maximo, Update data will wipe out your computer for your customizations if you don't have the settings in the, the configuration to tell Maximo what's going on. DBC files are what's used to make structural changes to Maximo. What's great about that? So why do we do all this stuff? Let me jump ahead in a moment. So test driven development, you want to do that so you can do your automated regression testing. Customization, if you if you have your extension XML, this concept right here, 
That way, uh, custom mutation will be processed by update database. There's actually a concept called byte injection that Matthew is actually, is actually, is actually going through and pulling classes and making by code changes to classes. Your custom mutation will be properly handled if you've got that extension XML in place. And your custom mutation set, configuration set, will not be wiped out. You're going to use DBC files, you're going to use DBC files. Also, you're going to implement simple to moderate or algorithmic configuration changes using an RMI script. The reason to do that is to streamline deployment. Um, also, by having DBC files, it forces a record, it forces you to keep a record of structural changes. And you can commit that stuff to your sort of code management. And then finally, by doing all this stuff, it enables you to follow the fast track protocol. So, finishing up, you guys know how to open the PMR. First off, I'm going to recommend you follow this template. When you create a PMR, start off the background. So I'll talk about the problem, I'll talk about what you're doing, give them context. We're trying to build this, we're trying to go through this process, this is what we've done. Then, in very precise detail, explain the problem. We do this, A, B, C, and the thing breaks. Precise steps. Environment, you're going to need to include a copy of what Maximo you're running, just go to help and about, and also include your log files. You will don't, don't waste one iteration of sending something in, waiting for someone to look at it, because all they're going to do is send you an email back the next day and say, hey, it's sent your log files. So save that day, make sure you send the system out, system error. Now, if you need to escalate the PMR, here are the steps. Call that number. If you need to talk to someone, say, I need to talk to the next failed technician. And if things are not getting done, ask your community manager. Be nice. The people who are just struggling, trying to do their job, but you can talk to them and they're, they, they can often help you out and get things escalated. I mean, when I, I've had things just kind of don't do anything, and I'll call and they'll, they'll get taken care of. All right, this is what I want to touch on. This, this is a, a great bit of information for people doing customization. So customizing maximum increases the potential of finding a bug. If you're doing things differently, right, you're new in different, different ways, it's a great way to flesh out things. A customer, a customer should not patch max, but it can, but it should. So you have to rely on IBM to be able to resolve the bug unless you can find a workaround. The resulting PMR that you submit from having a bug with your customization will often, often languish in L1 and L2 for a month or more. So that's, that's just a lot of time that's wasted. And it's even worse because they'll send you all of these somewhat idiotic questions and things to do. I had a problem with update database not working. It ended up being an issue an undocumented feature where you had to have all your dependencies in one depend tag, not multiple depend tags. Not written down anywhere. And it was breaking the update, the update database process, and the update database wasn't giving a very it was esoteric message that didn't give you anything to go on. So I created the PMR, and after a month, I got questions like, well, did you try single quotes instead of double quotes in your XML file? Seriously? So it wastes, I'm fine with them wasting their time, but not my time on the customers. So, and then receiving a hotfix. I've had one project where we had found that there was one very obvious error in the asset status class. And we submitted it at PMR maximum. It took them months to be able to get the one hotfix back to us. We ended up just having to work around it. That's it for uh, we got a, so the, the, the protocol is use the suggested best practices. Any customization that can be straightforwardly what the reason why you're gonna do that is that any customization can then be straightforward installed into a new maximum. And you're gonna do two things. You're gonna provide maximum with two packages. A package that installs the customizations working, and then you're gonna provide a second package that installs the customizations with just a, a minor, the minimal change to break them. You provide step-by-step -step instructions to get installed and how to replicate the problem and then provide an analysis of why you think the action, support analysis of why you think the problem is actually inside of Maximo, not in your code. That's how you can get them started. Maximo's a black box. You can say, here's my customizations. It works. I made this very smart and minor change. Probably not on my end. Let's look at what's going on with you guys. Maybe there's a bug. That's how you get them going. And then what I would do, what I will do, what I do, is when I to create a PMR, I'm called the media manager, tell me to follow this process. Set expectations. Three days, I expect you guys to be able to replicate this problem and do what I provide you. Five days, if after I answer all the questions that L1 and L2 have given me, I've done all the actions that they've wanted me to take, 
If they haven't been figured it out, I need it to be assigned to L3. And within 10 days, I need to talk to an L3 person who knows what's going on. Okay, the people who work in program maximum. Not resolved, right? Not resolved. Just talk to somebody else who knows this particular system, this concept, and hopefully from that conversation, you can glean enough information to be able to resolve the problem on your own. And then if you have to, you know, they have your hot fix, expect that, try to ask, ask them to get that done within 30 days or whatever you think is appropriate. So wrap up, I'm gonna try to, um, I need to, I'm gonna try to get this information put online on that place, but there's nothing there yet. It's just, there's nothing there. What I would recommend is if you have Twitter, I've created that Twitter account, Maximum Developer. As I continue to build up my seminar and all this information, I'm gonna post it there. So go ahead and follow that address on Twitter and I will do my very best to try to take the knowledge I've gained up over these many years and give different people so that they don't have to go through the same kind of difficult learning process that I did. All right, thank you for your time.